So good morning, I'm Attila de Groot from Cumulus Networks, and I'll be presenting a bit about eVPN on hosts. Um, now, I also gave this presentation on uh, RIPE last month, uh, so for the people who were there, uh, I'm sorry, uh, there will be some overlap, although I have some extra time to also show you a live demo. Now, one of the responses I got at uh, RIPE was also, oh God, not another vendor that is presenting on eVPN. Haven't we seen that already? Um, so, this is not a pitch on eVPN itself, uh, because all vendors are doing that, and uh, well, we all believe that you should implement that. Um, but as an SE working for a vendor, I'm involved in uh, a lot of uh, uh, customer implementations and also the problems that come with it. Um, now, uh, one of the issues always is, is integration with hosts and uh, some kind of uh, system that you have implemented on your hosts. Now, that is a bit what I uh, want to talk about uh, with you today. Um, uh, some of the issues that I'm seeing when implementing uh, networks and hosts, uh, etc. Um, the uh, issues that come with it. Um, and how I think that you could also solve that with eVPN. And obvious, uh, obviously some caveats that, uh, that come with uh, those solutions. Now, the first use case is basically if you uh, run a VM environment. That can either be uh, VMware with NSX on top, that can be OpenStack uh, uh, with the native networking or some kind of overlay networking. Um, or any other solution that uh, uses VMs, but its own overlay network there. Um, typically, what you see is that you have your hosts uh, or your hypervisors, they are connected with MLAG. Um, and then what you do uh, from those hypervisors is that you build VXLAN tunnels. Uh, although there are multiple uh, overlay technologies, VXLAN is the most dominant one these days. Um, and uh, you build those tunnels towards a network node in some form. Uh, if you look at VMware NSX, that's usually called an ESG. Um, I, with OpenStack, it is an uh, uh, exit node or a network node. Um, but in the end, what you'll see is that you get a double overlay. So from a network perspective, um, there is no integration, and basically you are ignoring the hosts uh, because the only thing you see are uh, UDP uh, or is UDP traffic with the encapsulated uh, Ethernet frames in it. Now, what uh, are the problems with this? Um, first of all, MLAC. So I think that uh, Cumulus and other vendors have uh, made MLAC uh, quite feasible, and in most cases it just works. Um, despite that, if you look at it from a network perspective, a lot of people don't really like MLAC because you have dependencies between two nodes uh, that should provide you redundancy. Um, so there's always some kind of synchronization between the two nodes uh, that you rather not have. And I think uh, with the people here is that uh, we are all known for uh, network protocols. Uh, you like your OSPF and BGP, uh, that might be a better solution for that. Um, now, the VXLAN between the hosts itself, um, uh, you get that double overlay. It is not necessarily a problem, but it, do, it does reduce your vi visibility from a network perspective, because the only thing you see are those UDP packets. Um, now, you do have your dedicated network nodes. Um, there are things like uh, with NSX that you have a distributed router. Um, OpenStack has the same with uh, DVR. Um, but still, you have to uh, push north-south traffic over uh, dedicated exit nodes, which could be a failure domain by itself. Um, but yeah, also that is something that you ha uh, would have to manage. And then looking at your orchestration, uh, who manages what? Um, and how do you integrate uh, network and hosts itself? One example is here is that uh, what you'll see is you have a bare metal server and you want to have that in the same layer two domain as your VMs. And we all say, okay, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't have your uh, or extend your layer two domain uh, uh, and you should just uh, use routing. 
uh, despite that we're all saying that a customer or uh, a user will say, but I still need my layer two domain for some fake reason or a fake application that they have. Now, another use case is containers. Um, now, we all uh, or mostly use uh, Docker for some management and some orchestration tool like Kubernetes, Kubernetes or Swarm on top of that. But if you look how a container visor, for lack of a better word, uh, is connected, then you do see BGP to hosts as well. Um, so that solves the MLAC problem that you would have with VMs. Um, and what you would typically do is you advertise uh, host addresses uh, where you do network address translation on, or you um, uh, would advertise the container IPs directly into your fabric. Um, in some cases, though, uh, even in a container network, uh, you have some kind of overlay. Uh, you see that by default in Docker Swarm is that they use VXLAN uh, between the container visors again. So, I have been at customers where you have different departments all managing their own solution, and what you'll get is that the network uh, guys have built a nice eVPN solution, the OpenStack guys have uh, built a nice overlay solution as well, and then the container guys are doing the same. Um, as you can imagine, the visibility on what is going on in your network and uh, even performance, uh, that could uh, um, be some issues here. Now, um, what are other issues uh, with container networking? Um, that is mostly the host networking. How do you solve that? What do you configure on your hosts? And how do you all manage that? Uh, the second one is multi-tenancy. Um, if you look at right now how multi-tenancy is arranged uh, on, uh, in container environments, is that you see that it's a bunch of ACLs because you have two tenants, either two different customers or two projects, and uh, they, uh, it's not allowed for containers to reach each other for security purposes. That all has to be managed by ACLs that uh, can't, be, uh, can't reach each other. Uh, the management of those ACLs can be done through a Kubernetes or another orchestration tool, but it's still something that you uh, would have to manage. The general issue, though, is that uh, you uh, can't uh, have overlapping IP space. And while we're all saying, OK, you shouldn't care about your IP addresses, uh, we have invented DNS for that, and uh, you shouldn't care if you get .100 for your IP address in that certain prefix. But I think we've all talked to a customer, and uh, you gave those arguments. And what they're saying is, yeah, but I still want that IP prefix. So. How can we uh, solve these two use cases? Now, um, Cumulus does a lot of uh, development in uh, open source, Linux, the forwarding, free range routing, uh, a lot of co uh, other companies as well. And I looked at all the possibilities that are already there. So what is already been implemented, and uh, uh, can this be solved in a different way? Now, if you look at uh, implementations, is that um, uh, there is a VLAN aware bridge these days in uh, Linux that is uh, in uh, the kernel since 4.0, as far as I know. Um, and you can just use that uh, instead of configuring a bridge for every different VLAN that you have. Certainly, if you have to push that to uh, Merchant Silicon, uh, that uh, gives you much more scalability. VRFs in the Linux kernel as well. Um, so you can use that to uh, separate IP prefixes and do multi-tenancy on a host. Uh, VXLAN support in the Linux kernel has been there for quite a while. Free range routing has an uh, eVPN implementation that you can use. Um, pretty much everything is upstreamed. Um, there are a network manager uh, called IF Updown 2. Uh, gives you the possibility to manage your uh, network settings uh, more flexible than uh, the old IF Updown 1 or uh, uh, what, uh, what Ubuntu is trying to implement in the, uh, 1804. And all uh, patches in IP Route 2 where you can manage your VRFs uh, as well. 
Now, how does, the, uh, does that look like for host connectivity? And uh, is that a difficult configuration? And how do you uh, manage that? Now, I have made a demo that I'll show you a bit later. But if you look at the host configuration, is uh, you have, uh, have to enable your two interfaces to your top of rack switches. Um, and you don't have to configure any IP addresses on it if you use free range routing. Uh, free range routing has something called BGP unnumbered. And the advantage is that you uh, don't actually uh, have unnumbered interfaces, but you are using the IPv6 link local addresses. So what you do have to enable in free range routing is that you have to enable uh, router advertisements on those specific links. Uh, because uh, based on that, your neighbors can detect a uh, link local address, and you can uh, set up a neighbor in BGP quite easily. So if you look at the configuration, uh, the only thing I have to set up for a, a BGP session is point to my local interface, and I'll put it in a peer group. And what you can see for the remote neighbors, uh, or the remote ASs, is that I'm using the keyword external. Because in a uh, IP fabric in a data center, you don't really care what your uh, neighbor AS is. Uh, it's in, uh, all in the same organization anyway, as long as it's different than uh, uh, from your own. You can use IBGP as well, um, but there are some uh, downsides if you are using IBGP, such as path hunting. Now, if you want to uh, use eVPN VXLAN on a host, uh, what you have to do is you have to advertise the loopback address on a, a system that you are using, uh, because that will be the endpoint for the VXLAN tunnels. Uh, so the only thing that you'll see in the underlay will be loopback addresses of all the hosts that you have. Now, and uh, the last thing you have to do is you have to enable the eVPN address family. And as you can see, that's just a statement and you include uh, advertisement of the IPv4 and IPv6 addresses. Now, if you have this all implemented, uh, what can you all do with it? Now, the first thing is layer two tenancy, uh, multi-tenancy. So um, you are using the uh, VLAN aware bridge, and uh, you tie a layer two VNI, a VXLAN tunnel that uh, will just encapsulate the original ethernet frames, and uh, we'll send it to a neighbor host. So in eVPN, you have a, a type 2 message. That type 2 message will uh, redistribute MAC IP uh, uh, combinations. And based on that, uh, you can forward traffic, and uh, MAC addresses are learned. So um, uh, you don't have uh, or have less flooding than you uh, would have in a plain VLAN. Because in eVPN, uh, something that you can enable as well is ARP or ND suppression, which means that you have a, um, a ARP proxy in the kernel that will answer on behalf of a remote host uh, because of the IP MAC combinations that are being learned. Now, another thing that you can do is uh, distributed routing. Um, there are a lot of discussions on where do you put your gateway in your network. Uh, one of the things that I said earlier in OpenStack or NSX, you have that uh, ex exit node um, that can be a failure domain. Um, but with eVPN, what you can do is you can reuse your gateway addresses on every SVI that you have in your network. So what you see here is that you have uh, two nodes uh, with uh, two VLANs in this case, and they uh, all have uh, SVIs with the same IP address. Now, what you also see is that um, they are in different VRFs or can be in different VRFs so that you can overlap the prefixes. And uh, that allows you to, uh, uh, to have north-south traffic uh, terminating directly on a host without uh, first tunneling through an exit node. Now, another thing that you uh, can do is your uh, layer three multi-tenancy. And this is specifically for uh, uh, VMs and such. Um, what you have to do is you enable your uh, VRFs on your host, and you have to advertise the prefixes that you are using. 
Um, if you are, for example, announcing uh, a sl uh, slash 28 per host where all your uh, VM IP addresses are, um, then you can do uh, things like that. And they are advertised using eVPN type 5 messages. Now, to use eVPN VXLAN with uh, layer 3 multi tenancy, um, what you have to do is uh, you have to create layer 3 VNIs. Now, if I uh, look at the configuration later on, uh, you see that uh, there isn't a specific layer 3 VNI configuration in the Linux uh, environment right now. Uh, that is something that is under development, so you, there will be a separate statement for layer 3 VNIs in the future. Now, how does that look like for containers then? Uh, with containers, what you can do is you can advertise each container IP address separately uh, into a VRF. What you typically do is you need some kind of plugin. Uh, several vendors have that. They, look, uh, they talk to the Docker API, and they announce the slash 32s from every container in a specific VRF. Um, now, given that you have uh, uh, containers in different VRFs or uh, for multiple tenants, you can overlap the IP addresses, um, and you don't need ACLs uh, to split te uh, tenant communication. If you want to have uh, some security within a tenant, you still would need ACLs, uh, but that's not always the case. Uh, so you have re uh, removed the need for ACLs entirely. Now, another solution that it brings is the integration with your network. Uh, as I said uh, before, one of the issues is that you get double overlays um, and that you're not really integrating with your, uh, uh, with your network. Now, if you, um, uh, without eVPN on host, if you want to terminate VXLAN tunnels on a leaf switch, what you typically need is you need an ML2 plugin or you need to use OVSDB. And that is something that um, uh, a vendor has to develop. Uh, they're not necessarily always a standard uh, uh, if you look at how it's being integrated. Uh, so it could cause quite some issues. Um, now, if you are using eVPN, um, uh, and if you look at regular vendors, uh, then they have all implemented this. And you uh, can distribute both uh, layer 2 and layer 3 to a, um, uh, some leaf switches that you have, and the bare metal host that's in there. So the bare metal host can be um, a member of the same layer 2 domain or the same layer 3 domain, um, and you have that part solved, and it's all according to RFC standards. Now, uh, what I'm showing here is more a proof of work. Um, so what you uh, see in this uh, screenshot is that I'm using kernel 4.17. Uh, I upgraded my demo a bit. I'm using 4.19 now because there are uh, still some bugs before the LTS release. Um, so th that also means that there's not really a commercial support. Um, uh, you can get from several organizations support on free range routing, um, but uh, Cumulus doesn't provide it at this moment. So if you want to implement something th uh, like this, you are pretty much on your own. Um, also, the uh, tools and availability is like, okay, how are you, uh, uh, what are you going to use? What are you going to implement? Um, I had to uh, compile pretty much everything myself, so it's not available as a standard package. Now, uh, what are future possibilities and uh, what uh, uh, should be done to uh, actually do that? Um, now, one of the issues is that orchestration systems, such as uh, OpenStack Neutron or Kubernetes, they don't ha know the concept of a VRF on a host, uh, or eVPN for that matter. So that is uh, still something that needs to be implemented. Uh, I'm looking myself a bit in OpenStack, but for the people that uh, are working with it, you know that the Neutron code, that it's quite complex. And um, yeah, that is something uh, that I would have to look into. Uh, so if there are any volunteers, uh, then yeah, feel free to approach me. Uh, another issue is the uh, host and network management. Um, 
Because the discussions that you'll have is who manages uh, what node. Basically, everything is the same. And will you let a sysadmin configure a layer 3 VNI or a VRF on your uh, switch, for example, through any orchestration systems or direct? That is a uh, discussion that you need to have in your organization. Now, a few caveats. Um, so, although there is ARP and ND suppression with eVPN, um, there are sti uh, is still some broadcast um, uh, frames that are being forwarded. Um, so you need to have an any cost entry. Uh, that means that uh, the kernel, or if you use it on hardware, the ASIC will replicate a broadcast packet to, um, to every VTAP that is interested in uh, that, uh, that particular VNI. Um, now, the issue with mil uh, merchant silicon is, is that you have a maximum number of any cost uh, uh, VTAPs that you can have for a certain VNI. Um, depends a bit on the silicon that you are using, uh, but it is a limitation. Um, now, uh, Cumulus and in FRR, uh, uh, there are two solutions for that. Uh, one is multi cost replication. So that means that instead of any cost, you'll use multicast, and it also means that you have to um, have to use uh, protocol independent multicast uh, on your systems. That is something that uh, is being worked on. Another thing is that you um, uh, can disable all broadcast in an eVPN domain um, because you are learning it locally, um, but that does have an effect on silent hosts. Because if a host never um, uh, sends any ARP messages, then the MAC address won't be learned. So uh, there could be applications that are doing that, uh, but that are the downsides of if you want to remove it altogether. <coughs> Another uh, thing is route leaking. So um, uh, if you, in this solution, if you want to have traffic between two different tenants, uh, you need to go through some external firewall or uh, router on a stick, um, because route leaking at this moment uh, isn't fully implemented uh, in uh, free-range routing. It should be in about two months, uh, because right now what you can do in a Linux kernel is only static route leaking between uh, two VRFs. Um, the example where you would use that is, uh, for example, a service tenant. Uh, if you are an uh, infrastructure service provider, you want to provide access to DNS, DHCP, and, and so on, that you might not want to have a member of that same VRF. Um, uh, last month, during my presentation, uh, not everything was uh, upstreamed into free-range routing. Um, Right now it is, so uh, you can uh, get free range uh, for, uh, routing version six, and all the VPN patches are uh, eVPN patches are in there. Um, now this solution also gives you the po uh, possibility to do more in the future. Um, one of them is uh, micro segmentation. So what I uh, said earlier is that within a tenant uh, you can do ACLs. Um, but that is something uh, uh, that you want to do more efficient than through an orchestration system. So one thing that I've been looking at is using BGP flow spec for that. Uh, although it's more uh, uh, known for using in combination with anti-DDoS uh, systems and such, uh, you have a full ACL definition. So given that you already have uh, BGP sessions to host and everywhere, uh, I would like to implement a flow spec where you uh, can push your ACL uh, changes and based on that you can uh, program ACLs uh, on a host. Now if you uh, use ACLs on a host, uh, performance is always an issue. Um, now uh, Facebook has shown in different presentations that they are using BPF for uh, filtering. Um, and that is something that uh, I think will be a good thing to look at. Um, in kernel 4.19, uh, there is an implementation for BP filter. I haven't looked at it myself, um, but that would be a possibility to use in combination with micro-segmentation. Now, uh, last, I'd like to uh, show you a bit of a demo uh, that I've been implementing.
So um, uh, with Cumulus, what you can do, uh, if there is no hardware offloading, you can virtualize um, uh, uh, the network operating system, and using Vagrant, you can build a virtual topology. Now, that is what I've done here. And uh, sorry, Stefan, I know that you uh, can't read it. Um, but as you can see, this is a, a spine leaf topology uh, with uh, two parts um, and a full uh, fabric. And now, what I've done additionally uh, here is that uh, I, in the first part, uh, leaf three and four, the, um, the MLEC lines are still there, but I've disabled that. And host three and four that you see on the, in the middle, uh, they are eVPN to the host. So uh, they have BGP sessions to the top of rack uh, uh, switches uh, with the eVPN address family enabled and VRFs configured. Now, I'm uh, logged in uh, right here into um, uh, server 03. And if I uh, would show you a bit uh, the configuration. Um, you see that it has uh, two BGP sessions uh, to leave 03 and leave 04 and uh, that it has uh, the eVPN address family enabled as well. Now, if I would have a quick look at, uh, for example, uh, the configuration of ETH1 and ETH2, oh, stupid keyboard, um, what you'll see is that um, there's no IP address configured on it, but if I uh, look at it more co closely, then you see that there is an IPv6 link local address, which is being used for that BGP and numbered session. Now, as I said, I'm uh, using kernel 4.19 uh, on Ubuntu 18.04, uh, um, and that has support for VRFs. So uh, what I did is I created four VRFs. Uh, one of them is a management VRF. Uh, so certain demons are limited to that VRF only. Um, and only my ETH0 interface is configured into that specific uh, VRF. So if I uh, would have a look at my uh, ETH0 configuration, uh, you see that it does DHCP in uh, my management network that I have, um, and it gets an address there. Now further on, I have the uh, three tenants, and they all have their own routing table. So if I have a quick look there, Uh, you see that there are several uh, routes learned here in this case. Uh, I have other, uh, uh, other nodes as well. Uh, on the bottom you see uh, for this tenant uh, 11.40, and that's actually over an L3 VNI to server 04. Um, so I should be able to uh, ping that. And I can't, of course. Well, I do have another server that I uh, tested uh, in advance of this presentation. Um, and that is server one. Uh, so that doesn't have uh, eVPN uh, on top. So uh, I'm showing here the integration between uh, an eVPN host and a normal host. And the only thing I'm doing is I have VRFs with an SVI uh, that can just uh, uh, reach each other. Now, uh, one thing that I uh, always like to show in a demo is the fact uh, that uh, pinging something is very nice, but it doesn't really show you anything. Um, uh, some of you might think, okay, that's nice, you're pinging something, but you haven't seen my configuration, so I could be pinging a loopback uh, uh, interface. So what I've done is I wrote an Ansible playbook, and what that Ansible playbook does, it deploys uh, iperf um, on all the uh, nodes, and I have configured network namespaces in the specific VRFs. Um, now these uh, uh, iperf uh, nodes, they uh, will uh, set up a full mesh of uh, very small streams, about 10 kilobit, and uh, what I've done in the virtual environment is that I have uh, implemented Grafana. 
So all the interface statistics are exported to uh, InfluxDB, and Grafana is reading out uh, uh, all the data. And I hope that when the Ansible playbook is uh, done, uh, we would actually see the traffic here uh, going up. Um, and yeah, with that last part, I uh, would uh, like to end my presentation. Um, and if there are any questions, then feel free to ask them. This entire demo, uh, you can download that from uh, our GitHub. Uh, it uh, includes the entire uh, virtualization environment. And uh, yeah, if you have any comments, uh, I'm on IRC, Slack, etc. So feel free to reach out. Da, da, da. Thank you, Attila. Are there? Thank you, Attila. Are there any questions? No questions? Oh, oh, what? So, have you any feedback from the uh, performance side of this on the host? So, like, what does it cost? So, um, if you do VXLAN on hosts, uh, you do have to encapsulate everything. If you don't do uh, uh, VXLAN offloading on a NIC, uh, then it does impact uh, uh, performance. I've understood that with recent CPUs, you can do about 2 to 3 gig of uh, VXLAN encapsulation. Um, but uh, both Mellanox and Intel, they do have NICs that can do VXLAN offloading. Um, so, yeah, that is yep. something that you do have to keep in mind. Yeah, okay, thanks. Okay. Because you <laughs> because you asked the question, a turtle. <laughs> and all others are gone by the way. So. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you, Attila. Thank you. The next talk will be uh